radical culture tendency. He entered the radical politics as an anarchist in the 1980s before he converted to Marxism. He has been politically active in Germany, England, and the US, and is currently a contributor to the IBTS Journal in 1917 and editor of the German publication Bolshevik. Um, Alex Kuznavich is a professor of sociology and anthropology at Mount St. Vincent University here in Halifax. His work focuses on questions relating to radical imagination, social movements, uh, and radical social change. Uh, he has had particular interest in anarchism, autonomous Marxism, <coughs> in his, no, yeah, in his work on politics. Uh, he has been involved and organized uh, with the, the past the solidarity movement, student labor, the anti-war movement, alter globalization, anti-poverty struggle, over 15 years. And today his activism focuses primarily on making the practice of research relevant and important for social movement struggles. So, uh, Chris Parson is part of a generation of radicalized, uh, which radicalized African city, but before Occupy. Uh, he works full time at the uh, King's Student Union, and he is finishing a master degree with a thesis on IWK, an Asian American late 60s and 70s new communist movement organization active mostly in New York and San Francisco, at Trent University in Ontario. Over the last decade, he has been active in the student and labor movement, and while he is not currently a member of a specific organization or party. He was a founding member of Solidarity Halifax here in town. He identifies as a non sectarian Marxist. Uh, Eva Curry to my right is a member of the Libertarian Communist Group Stand and has been active in leftist and anti party activism in Halifax and the Annapolis Valley through the International Workers of the World, so the IWW. Um, the Tenants Alliance of Nova Scotia and the Alpha Coalition Against Poverty. She has also been active in the feminist and environmental movements from a young age. Um, each speaker will have 12 minutes to make an introduction <coughs> remark. After they are each done, they will have three minutes each to address the points raised by other panelists, after which we will open to questions from the floor for the last hour or so. Um, I'll reiterate the. Sorry. Oh, you can read it. That's cool. Um, yes, I'll reiterate the panel description, which you all probably have read, but bring us all up to speed. So it seems that there are still only two radical ideologies anarchism and Marxism. They emerged out of the same crucible, the Industrial Revolution. The unsuccessful revolutions of 1848 and 1871, a weak liberalism to the <coughs> of state power, drive a worker movement, and the promise of socialism. They are the revolutionary heritage of all significant practical upsurges of the last 150 years. <coughs> oh, and all significant practical upsurges of the last 150 years have returned to mind their meaning for the current situation. In this respect, our moment seems no different. There are a few different ways these ideologies have been taken up. Recent worldwide square occupations reflect one pattern. A version of Marxist theory, understood as a political economic critique of capitalism, is issued to comprehend the world, while anarchist practice, understood as the anti-hierarchical practice that insists the revolution must begin now, is used to organize in order to change it. Uh, some resist this combination, claiming that Marxism rejects anti-statist adventurism and call for a strategic organization of the working class to resist the theory, and perhaps push forward a new deal. For a new deal. This view remains wedded to a supposedly practical welfare and social democracy, which strengthens the state and manages capital. There's a good deal of hand waving in both these orientations with regard to politics, tactics, and the end Finally, there have been attempts to leave the grounds of these theories entirely, but these often seem either to land right back in one of the camps or to remain march. To act today, we seek to draw up the balance sheet of the 20th century. The historical experience concentrated in these ideas must be unfurled if they are to serve as compasses, as compasses. <laughs> 
We see in what ways the return of these ideology represents an authentic engagement, and in what ways the return of a ghost. Where have the battles left us? What forms do we have for meeting, theoretically and practically, the problems of our present? So I think we will start with Lichtenberg. Yes, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so first of all, thank you to the Platypus Society for inviting me. I assume that invitation implies that you think I have something meaningful to contribute, so I will try to live up to those expectations. And special welcome to the young revolutionary in the back. <laughs> Always good to see some youth present. Um, so I'll talk about briefly about the split between the anarchists and the Marxists historically, then talk about what I see as an important historical event that holds some lessons for us, the Russian Revolution, and finish with some remarks about the Spanish Revolution and in particular what I see as the problems of anarchism in practice. All of this in 12 minutes. Um, but before I go into the actual presentation, I try to clarify what I mean by some of the words so that we are roughly on the same page or I help with that. Um, when I think of Marxism and anarchism, I think of two tendencies within the workers' movement, both of which see themselves as revolutionary as opposed to the tendency that is known as social democracy, which would work through reforms in parliament. When I think of Marxism, I think this word is interchangeable with Leninism or Trotskyism. Mm -hmm. I do not associate with it things like Maoism or Stalinism. When I think of anarchism, I think of anarchism in its best representation, in my view, as a former anarchist, um, as exemplified by people like Bakunin, Kropotkin or anarcho-syndicalism. And I think there are some commonalities between the two tendencies. I just want to highlight three of them. I think Marxism and anarchism agree on the need for the liberation of humanity through the destruction of capitalism. I also think that we agree on the fact that there is a class struggle going on between the exploiters and the exploited. And finally, I think that we agree on the need to destroy the existing oppressive capitalist state structure. What happens after that is where we diverge, I think, but I think we agree on the first part of the state question. So, the historical differences, and I am very aware that I'm very brief on this, the, the anarchists led by Bakunin, a Russian revolutionary, affiliated to the, what became known as the First International, an international workers' organization led by Marx and Engels. They were part of that. Um, but the conflict really began with the creation of the Alliance of Socialist Democracy, which was founded by Bakunin and his followers. And what it meant was that they maintained a somewhat secret organization within that first international and also started to publish articles um, that were critical of Marx. Um, so there was a lot of going back and forth over organizational matters, but as with every organizational dispute, at the heart of it is really politics. And the difference in politics between the Marxists and the anarchists really came to the fore at the 1872 Congress of the International in The Hague in the Netherlands, when there was a big debate between the Bakunin faction and the Marx followers about the role of the state in the transformation towards socialism. The Marxists argued that there was a role for the state in the transformation towards socialism, while the followers of Bakunin insisted that the state should be immediately replaced by self-governing workplaces and communes. The Bakunin faction lost that debate, and um, as part of the organizational wrangling that was going on, the Bakunin followers were actually expelled from the First International for maintaining that secret organization that I had mentioned earlier. So that was the historical split in a nutshell. Um, a few years later, by 1880, Kropotkin, another Russian revolutionary, announced the need for the permanent revolt through word, gun, and dynamite, which really set off the anarchists of Plikla in Russia on the course of anarchist terrorism, which really removed the anarchists from the masses and they isolated themselves very much, in my view, 
through these practices. The event that really uh, is key, I think, to understanding revolution and what in my view still holds a lesson is the Russian Revolution, which happened, the October Revolution in 1917. Now, the second international, another international body that followed collapsed basically in 1914 at the outbreak of the First World War because the different sections of the international ended up supporting their own government in their war efforts. So rather than being internationalists, they sided with their own national governments, which Lenin, the Russian revolutionary who led the Bolsheviks, identified as a complete disaster and betrayal of the spirit of socialism and internationalism. And his main learning from that collapse of the Second International was that he propagated the need for the revolutionaries to set up a separate organization from the reformists. He said we need to have our own organization with our own aims and therefore he advocated the need for a vanguard party, you could say. So he was the theoretical and practical leader of this concept, which I think is still valid today. So the Bolsheviks, the Russian um, organization that followed Lenin, they built a party of this type. They built a party that was democratic centralist, which meant that there was free discussion within the organization, a democratic debate, and there was a vote taken. But once that decision had been made, the decision was binding on all the members to carry out that decision, whether they originally agreed with the direction or not. The need for it was there because they needed to get something done. They needed to get a social revolution accomplished. And they needed a disciplined organization that was ready in order to carry out that task. So over time, the Bolsheviks managed to attract um, the best elements of Russian society, workers and peasants, to their program. Their program reflected the immediate needs of the peasants and focused on the revolutionary potential of the working class. And I think most importantly, the Bolsheviks distinguished themselves from other tendencies because they actually told the masses the truth. Whether that was popular at the time or not, they would not waver, they would not seek the line of least resistance. They would tell it as it is. And that allowed them over time for the workers to gain confidence in them because they were the ones who told them the truth about the Tsar and the and bourgeois democracy and the war that was going on. So they gained the support of the workers as was reflected in having the majorities in the Soviets in Moscow and Petrograd, the Soviets being workers' assemblies or workers' councils where workers and soldiers would meet and discuss how to proceed. That was even before the October Revolution. So they gained the majority there and really had the backing of the working class, which was, by the way, a very small section within the overall Russian society. They carried out the October Revolution, which was an armed uprising in 1917, and cleared out the weak government, actually with very little resistance, because the regime was so poor and so lacking in support that the initial reaction uh, was mainly a crumbling of the regime. So the difference, of course, with anarchists is that anarchists will say it is bad to set up the state as the Soviets did, and that leads to renewed oppression. But I think that the state exists as long as class divisions exist, as long as people are divided into different classes in society. So I think you fundamentally have initially the choice of either having a bourgeois state, the kind of state we have in Canada today, or in the US, or in Germany, which is a state that serves the interest of the bourgeoisie, the wealthy, the rich and powerful, or you can establish through a revolution a state that is what I call a worker state that is built on a different premise and that seeks to advance the interests of the workers and protects the new society from counter-attacks by the old ruling class. Now, 
I am a communist, and as such, I would like to see a state when there is no state. But that can only happen when the class divisions have been eliminated, when generalized want is eliminated. And in order to get there, we need a substantial development of the means of production. So it's not a, a moral question or what would be nicer to have, but it is one that is grounded in economic realities, I believe. How much time do I have left? Two minutes left. Okay. So in two minutes, the Spanish Revolution. Um, in 1936, a popular front government was elected in Spain. This scared the shit out of the bourgeoisie and the landowners, and General Franco launched a coup. He, tr he tried to seize power in order to protect the interests of the wealthy. The workers responded and seized the barracks, often in heroic battles where unarmed workers would take over barracks of the army and arm themselves in order to defend the, what was a developing social revolution. And the anarcho-syndicalist organization in Spain was extremely strong and powerful. The CNT FAI was a mass organization of Spanish workers. Um, and really, they began to dominate economic life through workers' committees at that time. They were running production and distribution through the anarcho-syndicalist organization. And the armed conflict with the forces of Franco escalated. So here is what I think is a sad, a tragic lesson. The CNT de facto held power in Spain through the workers' committees. But because they were anarchists or influenced by the ideas of anarchism, they refused to assume power they did not want to become rulers of society. They did not want to run the state because that was in conflict with their beliefs. So what happened? The old bourgeoisie continued to run the state and they continued to run affairs when in reality they had nearly been defeated. But the CNT, through their anarchist morals, basically handed the power back to the bourgeoisie. To me, that is terrible and a tragedy because the CNT could have pushed forward, but because they tried to adhere to the anarchist <coughs> principles, they basically missed a huge opportunity, in my opinion. And they then actually ended up joining governments in Spain in, in joint coalitions with the Communist Party of the Stalinists and bourgeois parties. They continued to work with them and wage a war against Franco, which eventually was lost. And again, the reason why it was lost <clears throat> is because the anarchists maintained an alliance with the bourgeoisie in the fight against Franco. And because they didn't want to scare away their partners, they did not advocate social revolution. But the, the need for social revolution was there and this is something that should have been pushed forward at the time. But the anarchists, in order to maintain their alliance, took that really off the agenda together with the communists. So for me, it is a tragedy because the CNT held power but refused to do anything with it. And the only people who benefited from it were the reactionaries, was the old ruling class. That to me was a lesson that actually was one of the reasons why I move from being an anarchist to becoming a Marxist. Because once I had investigated that issue, I began to understand that there is something wrong with the theory of anarchism as it then translates into practice. And I guess that is my time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks. Um, <clears throat> first of all, thanks everyone for being here today. Uh, thanks to Paul for inviting me back. It's nice to be here again. Um, so I, I have several, hopefully, you know, fairly well-connected, but perhaps loosely connected points that I, I want to make on the, on the topic of, of today's discussion uh, regarding Marxism and anarchism that uh, diverge somewhat from, um, from history or from a strict focus on history. So, um, and hopefully, I'd like to hear what many of you have to think about these topics, so look forward to the Q&A session, too. Uh, I'd like to first start off by um, 
saying that I think the description for today's panel is wonderful and provocative, and from my perspective, a little bit wrong. Um, so I, I think that the premise that Marxism and anarchism are the only significant radical ideologies today is, is a false position, actually, to occupy. And I think it's steeped in a certain kind of Western, modern assumption about what, revo what the notion of revolution actually means and, and how, it, how it needs to unfold. And uh, uh, that's something that I think I'll come back to a couple of times. It's also steeped in a certain notion of who the subject, who the appropriate subject of revolution is, in fact. So who that person is, right? And and for a long time, although it's a, you know it's certainly unfair to, to paint, uh, many people would identify with either of these traditions today as espousing this view. It was steeped in a view of sort of a, a fairly white supremacist, uh, cis normative, um, macho male working class subject. Imagine working class subject. Um, and and this is this is a problem for all kinds of reasons because oppression, of course, is in and exploitation are not manifest only within that fairly privileged sector of the working class. Um, so this doesn't mean, of course, that anarchism and Marxism aren't important um, globe-spanning ideologies, radical ideologies. In fact, they are and they continue to be important today. But it means that when we focus on them so exclusively, we tend to miss other very important lights in that constellation too. Um, one very interesting, I think, as I was preparing for this panel, I was reading, rereading uh, uh, a nice little piece by anarchist writer Andrew Flood. Uh, if you haven't seen this piece yet, it's called The Nostalgic Left. You can look for it online. Um, it's, it's a nice little piece, and in it, Flood talks about uh, our desire to uh, recuperate, return to, recapitulate the uh, a time when, when things seemed simpler, more, more black and white, more, more fully formed, where there was sort of a pure notion of revolution that we could seize onto, pure revolutionary subjects, and uh, the ideas of people who were associated with that struggle that seemed, uh, seemed divorced from the complexity, messiness, ambiguity, ambivalence of our realities today. And he suggests that this desire to return to a moment where, and he blames, he's not just talking about Marxists, let me be clear, he's talking about anarchists too, he's talking about lots of different mo high modernist revolutionary thinking here. Um, you know, that this is also a, uh, it's a response in some ways uh, to the messiness brought about by a focus on the intersectionality of oppression and exploitation. In other words, the, di the, the ways, the complex ways we need to understand how those systems of power exploitation work and operate and how they, how they, uh, they operate along lines apart from class. Not, 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 not including class, but apart from class too. Um, and I, I think this is, uh, I've noticed this nostalgia for, for sort of a, a modern left, uh, a, a high modern left, particularly recently in the wake of Occupy, in the wake of the auto-globalization movement, in the wake of the Arab Spring, where there's uh, an impatience on the part of a lot of people, I think understandably, in, in the face of what they see as failures of those different struggles to actually seize power or to, to make that revolutionary change, to return to something that seems to be able to wield the force necessary to, to achieve those ends. And I, I'm sympathetic to that. Uh, I certainly, you know, I think for many of us who observe these situations or are involved in them, we feel that way at times. But that kind of political efficacy resides in those, in those powerful, dominating, um, you know, high modern institutions like the party, like the state, and the ideologies that accompany them. Uh, I, you know, I'd like to problematize that. So I'm going to be going forward. I think you know a return to this, uh, a desire to return to great moments of history, and the, particularly the great men and their great ideologies that are associated with those moments. Whether it's the you know any particular any particular revolutionary struggle or the revolutionary icons we all know well is understandable. But again, it's 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 largely futile, and uh, and I think they're important. It obscures important paths that lead us beyond that. Um, <clears throat> Again, I would come back to this question. What do we mean, how do we understand, how do we conceptualize, how we practice this thing we call revolution? What does that really, what does that really tangibly mean in, in, in the realities of people in their day-to-day -day existence? Does it mean, you know, in the classic political science uh, definition of a term, uh, a rapid total change of a society's political and economic structures? Well, what does that mean practically? How does that, you know, and, and how do we envision that? How is that practiced? Um, how can that be realized? So um, that doesn't take us away, of course, from, I think, what is the, the absolute centrality of Marxism uh, as a form of analysis that has ruthlessly 
and, uh, and, and it, with very clear vision, unpacked capitalism as a form of exploitation. Uh, and, and from my perspective, I don't think that there's a better s set of ideas and theories, uh, forms of analysis around capitalism that is better in terms of understanding. There's no question about that. Um, as somebody would identify as a libertarian socialist or as, um, uh, as some variety of anarchist, perhaps, um, I would also say that I think the lessons taught by anarchism in terms of its commitment to grassroots organizing, to radical democracy, and uh, the values of letting a revolutionary process be led by the people themselves rather than by uh, elites who govern them is, is a set of insights that are also very central. But I, I, I wouldn't reduce the, that, this kind of debate to either of those camps either because I think we've seen in the last 30 years or so a much more interesting turn with some commentators, uh, folks like Richard Day, for instance, have called a more anarchistic ethic in many uh, social movements around the world, but let's, you know, my sort of area of focus is the, uh, the Anglo-North Atlantic, so I'm going to stay fairly well ensconced there. Uh, so this rise of this anarchistic ethic, which is not formally anarchist, it doesn't espouse any particular variety of anarchist uh, thinking, it doesn't lay claim to the great men and their great ideas, but it's interested in this idea of horizontality, egalitarian practice, radical democracy, uh, binding into it this radical critique of capitalism as well that is clearly borrowed from uh, or, or directly beholden to uh, a Marxist ideology, a Marxist form of analysis. But this, the rise of this anarchistic ethic, uh, you know, to, to, to sort of do terrible injustice to a very diverse history of struggles here, uh, emerges in the 70s and 80s out of a frustration, out of a tangible, palpable frustration on the part of many activists and would-be revolutionaries with the failures of those very forms of organization, the, the party, the state, the, the call to discipline, the call to solidarity, that is often a call to the erasure of difference, the marginalization of oppressed voices, the marginalization of, of non-privileged positions within that discourse. And so it's, it's, it's not just an ideological move, is what I'm saying. Many of these activists and, uh, and revolutionaries in the 70s and 80s turn to this because they see in it a greater reflection of their own lived existence and their desire to build complex relations of solidarity with other people in struggle who are who not quantifiable or, or, or uh, can't categorize them within the simple uh, orbit of the so-called working class, right? So, um, so where does this take us, right? So, well, it takes us through, you know, through the, the, the long ways of struggle we see through the 80s, the rise of all kinds of anti-authoritarian movements, whether that's in anti-racist organizing or in uh, emerging attempts to build settler indigenous solidarity or in, uh, in, in, in the, the often uh, terribly ignored histories of the incredible contributions that feminism, particularly radical and socialist feminism, has made to the fabric of social justice struggle. Uh, around the world, particularly in the global north, but elsewhere as well. Um, so out of this, you know, then we have uh, the rise of the alter globalization movement. And again, you know, the, the understandable frustrations expressed in a high modernist language with the inability of that movement to seize on its tactical uh, successes in some moments, its uh, the, the groundswell support, and do something with it. Uh, we hear in it the, uh, the admonishments of things like the World Social Forum, and it's a process that I'm critical of, so I'm not trying to hold up the WSF as some kind of great paragon of where we need to go, but you know the demand that the WSF become more like a party, more like an organization that can issue a set of demands and goals and principles towards which struggle needs to be directed. And we hear it in the voices of, uh, of self-avowed radical leftists here in Canada and the States elsewhere in the wake of Occupy and other uh, anti-austerity struggles that seek, you know, that try to try to uh, reduce this complex set of desires for liberation to a ten-point plan on the part of people practicing it. Uh, to to be specific, to be clear, to have goals, to have leaders, to be understandable, to be renderable in the idiom of the time, and to speak the language of power. Uh, but isn't that isn't that part of the problem? Isn't that that, that part of the problem that in seeking revolution we return to the very forms of domination, the exercise of power that were familiar to us, that we have been, to some extent, you know, bred into, and, uh, and that, that are part and parcel of those, of those forms of domination. It's no accident, coming out of the 60s, that uh, we heard the voices of, specifically, of radical feminists and others, uh, demanding that their, their leaders, uh, leaders of those movements be held accountable for the perpetuation of things like patriarchy and sexism. 
within the structures of those movements because those movements didn't free even speaking a language of sexual liberation, for example, didn't free uh, free their members from those from patriarchy, for example, right? So, um, and just to uh, to bring sort of my comments to a close here, since I'm running out of time, I just wanted to finish on on what I see as a productive note, and it just happens to be that uh, a movement that I spent a lot of time uh, working with and on in terms of my academic research uh, is the Zapatistas, this uh, uh, revolutionary movement in the far southeast of Mexico. It happens to be, we just passed the 20th uh, anniversary of the Zapatista uprising, which began on the first day that NAFTA came into effect on January 1st, 1994. And I've been thinking a lot about the Zapatistas lately. Um, it's interesting that a lot of different radical ideologies tried to lay claim to Zapatismo, uh, to the political ideology and practice of the Zapatistas in the days, weeks, months, and years following the Zapatista uprising. Zapatistas have been called Marxists, they've been called anarchists, they've been called different variations of radical political ideologies, and they've basically distanced themselves from all of them, saying that they are this complex confluence of these different ideas. They certainly have uh, a robust analysis of capitalism that emerges from a Marxist critique of it. They have a political practice that looks something like anarchism, but in fact emerges not from some ancient indigenous tradition, but from the practices of indigenous communities learning to work past many of the entrenched barriers and power politics that occupied their communities for a long time in these in the far southeast of Mexico. So what I'm suggesting, and I think you know, without trying to hold up the Zapatistas as a singular revolutionary model, is that what makes them so interesting, and indeed what makes them still relevant, I mean a lot of people want to write them off, but a movement that continues to control about a third of the territory in the state of Chiapas, and uh, has built institutions, including governmental ones, and health, and, uh, health clinics, uh, schools, others, um, that has actually uh, weaned people from the Mexican state and brought them to the Zapatistas' own institutions, not, beca not at the point of a gun, but because they work better, because they work uh, in, a, in a more just, dignified, and democratic way, uh, is a model of success. And I would suggest in not adhering to any of those singular lines has offered a new kind of synthesis that moves us towards uh, something exciting. And that has revealed, I think, that the modern subject of revolution has been proven to be hollow. It's not entirely wrong, but it's a product of its context. It's demonstrated that the modern imaginary of revolution has revealed itself as incomplete, and insufficient to live up to its promises of liberation. Uh, it may be good at doing certain kinds of things and exercising certain forms of political power, but it's not good at doing other things, and certainly not at making that kind of idea of liberation manifest. I think we'll let Jesus talk here. Sure, and I, I'd love to continue talking about this in the Q&A periods. Awesome, bro. <laughs> Chris, whenever you're ready. Um, so I'm not actually checking my phone, I'm just starting to clock, so oh, I don't have time there. Um, so yeah, I mean, I basically um, kind of want to situate my remarks in some ways personally in so much as I situate myself in a position that I think a fair number of people in the room probably also find themselves in, which is that I came of age politically in some sense, that is moved from sort of a uh, mainstream sort of uh, boring liberal or social democratic politics to something I consider more radical politics uh, during a time that basically coincides with the general decline in sort of the power and importance, probably not importance, but the power and sort of popularity of the alter and anti-globalization movements, but uh, before sort of the emergence of uh, the energies that became sort of uh, occupied, right? And so one of the reasons why I think it's important to situate uh, what I want to say in that context is because in some ways, it's I am from a generation that oftentimes uh, I think Marxism either was not an option or the version of Marxism that we received uh, and that we experienced was certainly one that I think um, had internalized many of the at least organizational structures of anarchism, right? Which is to say that uh, even before Occupy, I think that if uh, you, know, you were a 20-something involved in organizing in you know, 2008, um, particularly if you happen to be involved, I think really either in the community or in sort of campus organizing, the default mode of organization in places like uh, public interest research groups uh, in community organizations was one that at least talked about sort of a horizontalist mode of uh, organizing and which primarily did not imagine the possibility of seizing state power. So in some ways, anarchism is the default for people, I think, that are at least politically of my generation. 
Um, and the result of that, and the result I think of those sets of experiences of organizing within social movements and organizing within these, is that I uh, want to, like, that I definitely have the very desires that uh, I think Alex warns you against, right? It's that I have the high modernist desire for the ability to seize state power, because I think we've seen time and time again that um, the alternatives over the last decade have certainly, uh, at least in the global north, at least in Canada, at least in the context I've organized in, have been counterproductive not just to failing to get us closer to a revolution, but I think I've also done a very poor job of trying to generate reforms, right? So if the question for, I think, most Marxists now, I think many Marxists are coming to the realization that what we need is not to pit reforms against revolutions, but I think many of us are turning to someone like Luxembourg who, can tell, who wants to tell us and wants to suggest that reforms are a way towards revolution, that I think that in many ways the sort of anarchism that I've uh, experienced and come in contact with and sort of has been one that says that uh, we want neither reforms nor revolution, we want something else, um, and that that something else, uh, I, I think, doesn't get us closer to sort of the widespread spread liberation sort of at a massive scale. Um, that said, uh, rather than trying to like either explain Marxism or didn't sort of overall denounce anarchism, I don't really want to do that, nor do I want to try to sort of tally up the scorecard of the 20th century, um, but rather, I think, talk about what's happened since the close of the 20th century, and to sort of try to sketch out some broad themes that I think would be useful for us to think about the question of the relationship between anarchism and Marxism for the next like hour or so, because um, so, I think that uh, I think all of us probably agree on the point that I think the probably the more fruitful thing that's going to come out of this is uh, engaging in a discussion with everyone in the room. Um, so I think the sort of first thing uh, I want to basically claim or argue is that uh, at least my generation, and I don't want to, and I think that that is itself sort of a problematic statement. I think there's uh, a lot of different people, a lot of different experiences within people that are broadly my age or that I've broadly been organizing with or that have been organizing um, at the same time as me that sort of my generation needs to take seriously the questions that are central to this discussion. That is to say that uh, the points where Marxism and anarchism diverge are points that need to be interrogated, um, and that we haven't necessarily done a good job of that, and that we often uh, call ourselves Marxists when what we actually are doing is organizing in ways which are uh, at least in form uh, anarchistic, or sometimes we refer to ourselves as anarchists when really the impulse that we have is to uh, work towards something that vaguely represents sort of uh, mar either Marxist forms of organizing or Marxist goals, but one thing that we don't do well is actually try to articulate clearly either what our goals are or sometimes even why it is that we're choosing specific organizational forms. I think the other one of the other things that I think is important here is that um, in the last 15 years, there's been, we've, I would think, a wild swings back and forth on what the role of, what the existence of the state is, right? Like in the early 2000s, particularly uh, in the work surrounding the alter globalization movement and emergence uh, in the West of sort of an interest, in the English-speaking world, an interest in sort of um, autonomous Marxists, I think particularly of uh, Hart and Negri and people that sort of were writing around that. Um, there was this idea that in the early 2000s with the globalization movement that the state had become uh, irrelevant, or at least individual state sovereignty had become irrelevant. And I think that uh, most people now would say that that was an overstatement, um, and that the reality is, is that we have to grapple with the question of the state, whether we want to, and that we have to grapple with the question of the state regardless of when we want to do away with the state. Because I think I would agree with everyone that the ideal goal here is the eventual, eventually eliminating the state. And in the short term, certainly, I think we all agree that eliminating sort of the bourgeois, um, liberal democratic state is an immediate goal. Um, the question is what to replace it with and when. Um, so the question, you know, one of the things we have to think about is what do we do with the state? How do we imagine the state? How do we interact with the state? Do we challenge the state? What do we ask of the state? Do we ask anything of it? Um, how do we, I think there's another question, which is how do we organize ourselves, organize ourselves politically in the here and now, right? Is do we emphasize uh, a, a politics that uh, is purely, um, or places a really large emphasis on uh, being prefigurative, that is saying that our, our current politics need to reflect the world we want to create, or do we recognize, as I think I do, the idea that, um, like, I don't want to live in a world where I have to be deceptive. I think this is one example I used earlier today. But the reality is that if I want to organize my workplace, plug your ears, my boss, um, if I want to organize uh, my workplace, um, that I would need to be deceptive in that case. I couldn't tell my boss that. And I think that like, we, so we recognize that our politics will never be purely prefigurative because we have to make compromises. So the question is, 
what compromises are we, are we willing to make in that sense uh, in exchange for sort of effective political work? Um, and what, I think the other question is really is like, also what is the actual target of our political work? I think, it, are we aiming at transforming the broad mass social movements around us? Are we aiming at targeting the state? Are we aiming at targeting um, some vague object we might call civil society? Or is the target of our political work ourselves, right? Some sort of personal transformation, which I think it, it is for some uh, activists, right? But I think these are all questions that really, I think, are central to this question of what is the interaction between Marxism and anarchism, because I think both these traditions uh, have a variety of different answers within them. Um, but they're also things that I think that we often don't spend time to actually sit down and think about. Um, so I think that more than anything else, my hope is that like, this can be a conversation about being deliberate in our actions and deliberate in our thoughts. Um, and I think that, for me at least, my experience has been that the default position, if you're uh, in many organizations of you know, people in their 20s, is that a sort of horizontalist, leaderless, and in some way consensus-based decision making is the default on the radical left. And the assumption is, is that to do otherwise means that you're operating in sort of a bureaucratic, social democratic or liberal organization. Um, and that I think that, that it might be right that we should organize horizontally all the time, but like we need to actually decide why we want to do that. And often we don't. We just assume that to do otherwise is somehow immoral, right? Um, and it might be immoral, but like let's actually have out those arguments. Um, so we may not need, like in 2014, we might not need the party, right? We might not need the party of the proletariat to lead to the revolution. But we also like, need to decide that maybe we do need that, but also maybe we don't need collectives, affinity groups, or networks, but we need something else. Maybe what we do need is a disciplined organization that cuts somewhere in the middle, or also one that like, takes the lessons of those. But I think that one of the problems, again, that we've fallen into is that uh, for many of us who have never experienced the party, we've already decided that it's something that we need to organize, right? Um, and so I, I think that that sort of is one of the things that I think is important. I've got sort of two other broad things. One of them is uh, this sort of question of leadership, right? Um, which I think is central to this. Mm -hmm. And one of the things to keep in mind is that anyone who identifies as being politically radical, by definition, um, like it's a truism that the majority of people don't share your political views, right? Otherwise you wouldn't be a radical, you'd be in the mainstream, right? Um, so what the hell do we do about that? Like, do we, how do we encounter that problem? Either we're in a situation where we close ourselves off uh, and organize simply amongst those who share our views, or we sit and we wait for the objective conditions to magically radicalize the people, or we have to actually go out as people who are more radical than our peers, more radical than the people that we want to engage with, and interact with them in some way. And maybe that way is providing, uh, is, to, is to provide something that, akin to leadership, politically. Um, but we need to think about what that means. I think the one thing that we have often avoided is the reality that like, this is a, a problem that we need to uh, sort of launch ourselves into. And I think that goes in as well, with, uh, is connected to this question of internal leadership. That we do, we fear an internal leadership that would, uh, that would allow us to, to question what we mean by leadership, right? Which is, we've become so scared of any concept of leadership that we don't even want, like, an, sometimes we are scared of having an administrative leadership that can simply make sure that, like, we know who's photocopying the pamphlets for the meeting. That can sometimes, because we are so scared of appearing as being like a hierarchical organization that we can fall into those traps. Um, but also the problem is, is that if we don't recognize the tendency towards leadership, we often fall into actual political leadership that we don't want, right? Which I think is a consistent problem that we encounter. Uh, I think there's also, uh, I think we can talk about this uh, in the discussion period, I think there's also a fear and a scared, like in some ways we're scared because we don't know what it would mean to seize power anymore um, or to hold power, um, but I think that's bigger than I can get to. I, I think that the last thing I want to say in the last minute is, there's also this question as the final thing, which is a question of what do we do about social movements, right? Which is, I think, similar to this question of leadership. Uh, and I think that uh, in some ways there's been a tendency to, because we haven't asked what do we do, like what actually do we do about leadership when we're more radical than, than the general union membership, that there's been a refusal to actually, by some people in the left, to actually engage in sort of large unions beyond the local level, and instead look at setting up completely alternative structures 
for me, the problem with that lies in the idea that like, I can't comprehend revolution without the masses. And I, in some ways, the, you know, I still hold out perhaps an archaic, perhaps high modern belief that unions can be transformed to actually uh, serve as a, as sort of a, to serve as a vehicle for the will of like sort of the working class, and, and not the working class that was conceived of in 1917, but a working class that we need to reconceive of in 2014. So I think that asking how we deal with mainstream social movements that are themselves liberal or social democratic and uh, as radicals, how do we deal with things like the student movement, how do we deal with um, the labor movement without either abandoning them nor simply preaching at them, um, nor trying to take them over uh, and bend them to our will, but like how do we find something else? And I think that the answer to that in some ways lies in trying to think through the problem of like, the problems that I think the question of like the relationship between anarchism and Marxism lay out for us. So I think uh, I'll leave it there, but I think that there's probably a lot for us to say in the question. Thanks. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me to speak on this panel. Um, I, as the, the bio said, I'm a member of a libertarian communist organization in Halifax called STAND, um, which is uh, sort of one possible strain of anarchism is one way of, of thinking about it. Um, and so I want to kind of also speak from that end of the discussion. Um, I think, in my understanding, the panel was focusing on radical ideologies today. Um, so when we talk about um, sort of our understanding of Marxism or anarchism today, uh, one of the sources that I find really helpful is uh, Cindy Milstein has a short, very readable book called Anarchism and Its Aspirations from AK Press. Um, and I think it describes modern, modern anarchism quite well. Um, since my time here is short, I'll just recommend the book to you and uh, focus on, on one particular idea. Um, I want to talk about an anarchist vision of community. Um, so anarchism is commonly understood to be a, a non-hierarchical, anti-authoritarian philosophy. Uh, if one only pays attention to what anarchism has to say about individual autonomy, I think it's easy to, to falsely believe that anarchism and Marxism uh, are non-overlapping. Um, but a sort of a central idea in anarchism is that there's a dynamic balance between individual autonomy and the communal good that can be attained. Um, so that, that this is something that, that we can work towards and that's actually attainable. Um, in fact, I would argue that these two principles exist not in competition, but necessarily reinforce each other uh, through solidarity, mutual aid, and compassionate social interactions. Um, I think one thing that's come up in it's the advantage of going last that's come up in the, in the other uh, uh, speaker's uh, preliminary remarks is we don't talk about as much what we mean by terms such as authority and power. Um, I, following uh, Hannah Arendt somewhat, I would define authority as an entity, an individual, an office, a bureaucracy, or other group to which personal autonomy has been ceded. Um, so I use autonomy rather than freedom here uh, just on purpose. Uh, I believe that the, the view that society is a dynamic tension, a power struggle between individuals attempting to exert their individual freedoms, uh, where a dynamic equilibrium between civil liberties and the communal good is possible, but the two are inherently at odds, is based on a false vision that conflates sort of ideas of freedom to with ideas of freedom from. Um, this is a worldview where Sort of in, in the traditional language, the full expression of man and his human nature is the unfettered expression of his will and desires, and where, where power over, the ability to influence, coerce, or, or force others um, to one's own will, is seen as, as the pinnacle de or definition of individual strength and character. Um, I use his specifically because I think that this is a necessarily patriarchal and oppressive view of human relations. Uh, I think it forces an exceptionalist view uh, on those who attempt to exercise their, their freedom from, their autonomy, um, and throws up inherent structural obstacles to, to an anarchist vision, to, to creating this balance between individual liberties and the uh, communal good. Um, so uh, autonomy, um, it's the ability to make decisions about your own thoughts and emotions. Uh, about the integrity of your own body. Uh, it entails freedom from, so it entails freedom from violence, coercion. Um, it involves some of our freedom twos, uh, freedom to individual expression that doesn't harm others, uh, rights to speech, education, healthcare, um, a safe place to live, uh, nutrition, 
Um, but autonomy is, is not synonymous with all of the freedom twos. It's, autonomy is um, very distinct, for, or it's, its antithesis is imposing one's will on others. If you have a respect for individual autonomy, and you respect that as a concept, then necessarily the idea of imposing your will on others is anathema to that. Um, so, uh, and that's through, through violence or coercion, physical or social pressure. Um, perhaps uh, one of the strongest recent examples of how respect for of individual autonomy and, um, and concern for the common good can actually reinforce and support each other comes from the feminist movement. Um, and comes from ideas around models of enthusiastic consent for sexual and romantic relationships. Right? So this is the idea that um, our personal relationships, where we're, we're really personally coming into this, this I, or dealing, grappling with the idea of you know, what I want, what I want for me, what I want from you, um, versus you know, what's good for other people. Um, this is something that, that you have to grapple, grapple with very intimately. Um, and so the, the, the feminist notion of, of enthusiastic consent uh, says that actually, you know, if I am respecting your autonomy uh, as an individual, then not only is that you know, an ethical imperative, but it makes our relationship together stronger and better and more fulfilling and uh, more, more supportive for, for myself as well. Um, and so that's one sort of small scale example of where we can see that the idea of respecting individual autonomy and what's best for the communal good um, are actually like not even are they competing or at odds, you know, not even can we attain some sort of careful balance between them, but in fact they, they really intimately reinforce each other. Um, I would say uh, also uh, that so humans are a social animal, and most of us yearn for some sort of community. Um, kind of historically, like in, in the popular sort of conception, what we think of as anarchism, we think of you know, people are drawn to anarchism um, first because they're interested in, in this anti-authoritarian idea, um, in the idea of, of maintaining their individual autonomy. They're interested in sort of that side of the equation of anarchism. Um, and, you know, this may be after many negative experiences with communities that are based on exclusion and hierarchical structures. Um, those of us who have experienced um, various forms of oppression, um, whether it be uh, gender-based oppression, uh, class-based oppression, uh, racial oppressions, uh, you know, uh, cis-sexism, heteronormativism, um, or ableism, or you know, any of the other uh, sort of class hierarchies that get set up in our society, um, this, can be, this can be a very, uh, you know, very, very compelling idea that I can go and I can, I can sort of just worry about expressing myself. I, it, it, experiences with oppression can make you very wary about this idea of the common good and the idea of engaging with the group in general because the group in general in our experience um, might be universally uh, uh, negative towards us. Um, so we may share this yearning for community that's expressed in like nostalgic peons to mid 20th century American small town life. Um, but we know that, that in a community defined by not being a member of a town with a competing sports team, or a community, you know, a country with a different economic system, or a community that's defined um, even by being different from a particular group of neighbors with a different skin color or religion or sexual orientation, that we're going to be excluded, sometimes violently so. Um, and so we feel that lack of community sometimes even the worse for in a world where, where it seems like that idea of community is, is so present, yet so unattainable for, for those of us who are excluded. Um, and so I, I feel that, that this can, can, is sort of, in some ways, a central tension, right, that defines uh, anarchism, is how do, we, how do we reconcile our need for our, uh, sort of maintaining our own individual autonomy with, create, with being members of a community, with that impulse towards community. Um, an anarchist vision of community, unlike the ones that many of us grew up with, um, is built on inclusion rather than exclusion. 
Uh, trust, in some form, underlies all human social organizations. Uh, so in an anarchist vision of community, um, ideally trust is extended to everyone unless they prove themselves uh, to be untrustworthy. Um, and as opposed to, you know, like for myself, I moved around a lot during my life. And so one of the things that I've encountered a lot is there's a tendency for people to be very wary of outsiders. And so most of our communities are built on this idea that trust has to be earned, that, that you know, instinctively we don't trust the outsider. Um, and that, that gives us communities that are built on exclusion versus communities that are built on inclusion. Um, in an anarchist vision of community, I would say not only is individual autonomy respected, um, but care for others is encouraged, supported, and prioritized. So an anarchist vision of community entails uh, loving interactions between romantic partners, as I mentioned, friends, neighbors and acquaintances, and strangers. Um, in Cindy Milstein's book, and in a lot of, I think, more uh, modern writings about anarchism, the word love comes up a lot. And that's uh, love defined as Bell Hooks, or Fred Rogers would use the term as a verb, right? not as an emotion, but as a practice. Um, Anarchism is a model for ordering social relations, uh, to practice it well and fully. We can't focus solely on the relations between individuals. I've been talking a lot about that as examples because I come from a feminist background where we talk about the personal as political. Um, but we can't ignore our current model of social relations that imposes class systems, uh, hierarchies, and resultant oppressions on all aspects of our lives. So I'd say that a Marxist class-based analysis of economic structures um, is fundamental to being, uh, having a, a solid sort of anarchist practice and anarchist understanding of the world. Um, as is um, a feminist class-based analysis of patriarchal, social, and institutional structures, um, a class-based analysis of uh, you know, ha racial and um, um, colonial uh, interactions, hierarchies, um, and structures. Um, but anarchism is also an ethic. It's an ethic that says that we respect our individual autonomy. We respect, I respect my individual autonomy. I respect your individual autonomy. I, I respect that principle of individual autonomy. Um, and the, the working for the common good grows out of that respect. Um, so anarchism is far more than a collection of tools, as, as the introduction to this uh, uh, panel kind of posits. Um, it's this ethic. Um, it's, it's a model for ordering social relations. Um, anarchists do focus on the means to achieve revolution, not just on the end result. Um, so, but this is, partly this is out of uh, an idea about what's effective for organizing, um, but partly it's out of a conviction uh, born by much experience that our means fundamentally and inextricably shape our ends. Um, so if the end that we seek is a society whose fundamental ethic and social relations are based on this uh, mutual respect vision, um, then we have to work towards that end rather than running out of tangent or in the opposite direction from it. Um, that said, anarchist structure can also be quite strategically useful um, for even movements without an explicitly anarchist goal. Um, there's so the Occupy movement has come up uh, a number of times. Um, it's really interesting to, to sort of follow what the various groups that were involved in Occupy Wall Street have been doing um, sort of in the intervening time since uh, sort of the encampments got broken up. Um, so I, for example, I follow the main Occupy Wall Street blog, and they have these uh, Theory Thursdays. Um, so every Thursday they get somebody to post a, an article about sort of uh, yeah, modern radical theory. Um, so a recent one, uh, last week or the week before, uh, was talking, for example, about um, secessionist versus mosaic models for radical organizing. Um, the idea that going off in a commune uh, with people who you agree with politically um, can be very individually, you know, personally fulfilling, but it really isolates you from the rest of society and, and sets up structural obstacles to actually um, working to create change. Um, the, the article um, contrasts that not with vanguard parties, but with a mosaic or network model of organizing, where we each um, are involved in some sort of activity that 
meets needs of people in our communities, our neighbors, right, in our towns where we live, um, meets immediate needs, but organizes uh, in a model that is going to empower people um, to help them develop their, their sense for their own individual autonomy and their ability to, to uh, maintain that in the face of uh, structural uh, oppression, structural hierarchies, structural coercions, and violence, uh, physical violence. Um, and we may be focusing on one small piece of creating uh, the new society that we want to live in, but we can be networked with other people who are working on those other small pieces. And in building those networks, we are actually creating um, the structure of our new society that we want to see after our revolution, revolution very broadly defined. Um, so that's a model that is sort of an ethical imperative, but it's also a model that, as an organizing model, is strong. It's the model that has kept the Zapatistas, for example, uh, going uh, for 20 years. Um, for many um, different small-scale uh, groups in different parts of like, the United States where I'm from, uh, the long-term uh, efforts that have made a, a difference in people's daily lives that have been going on for years and years and years. So this is the sort of organizing model that, that sustains them. Um, okay, I think we'll have to end on that note. Uh, so, in the same order, we'll have three minutes to address points raised by Mr. Fabellist. Yes. <clears throat> so, I'm going to speak to the points in the area of power, forms of organizing, Occupy, I think several people commented on it. So, I'll take Occupy as a common phenomenon um, that swept North America, which really was quite amazing. Um, it was a powerful, popular outburst against the excesses of capitalist rule. And it was very refreshing, and it bypassed the traditional left organizations to a large extent, I would say, which partly is a reflection of the failure of the traditional left organizations, I have to add, being a member of one of them. <laughs> but that's reality, so I acknowledge that. And what arose was the sort of the horizontal organizing forms, which seemed democratic and attractive to many people, I think. And one thing I encountered in my involvement in Occupy in Connecticut and uh, upstate New York was the consensus model of decision making, which, to be quite frank, I couldn't get my head around at the beginning. Um, but I tried to look watch and learn. And what I learned, and I'm not trying to be sarcastic about it, what I learned was that it didn't work. And I think that's what everybody learned over time. Because while the original idea was that everybody had to agree on what we're going to do, I believe that in many places it was actually very rapidly modified to something like a more 80-20 or 90-10 consensus model. Because in practice, this great idea of consensus turned out to be unworkable. I think that's an established fact. That was one of the actual experiences of Occupy, that this great idea of consensus, even amongst people who seemingly agree on so many things, didn't work. I think that's an important lesson. And I think it is true that Leaders are sometimes needed. Um, and for me, I think leaders will always emerge. And I think the important thing is that leaders are accountable to the rest of the group, association, whatever it is. And you can only have accountable leaders if you have a proper process of electing and recalling, if necessary, those leaders so that they are not elected forever and do whatever they like, but that they are ultimately responsible to the broader group of people. That they can say, you misled, you did a bad job, we recall you and replace you with someone who is actually better. And I think leaders are respected and trusted in many areas of life. When it comes to political leadership, there seems to be a distrust, partly because we have such a bad political system 
that there is a natural distrust, and I understand that. But we trust, for example, the technical leadership of the bus driver to do the job. We entrust our lives to the bus driver as a technical leader of bus driving, right? You normally don't question that. You don't start the bus route by saying, can I see your driving license? How many years have you been driving? How many accidents have you had? You trust him or her to do that job because it seems like he's doing this for a long time, she's been driving that route for a long time, it all seems to work. So we recognize leadership in many areas of life and accept it, but when it comes to political leadership, it's all very different. And that's why I think it's important to understand that political leadership is also a form of technical competence or a form of art, whatever you want to call it, or a combination of the two. You can be a good political leader in radical politics, or you can be a bad one. Some of it depends on your ideas, and some of it depends on what style of leadership you have. But it is always fundamental that there are processes in place which allow the broader membership to control the leaders, to elect them and to recall them when necessary. That allows true democratic control over leaders. If that is not in place, and I believe bourgeois democracy does not do that very well, then you have actually the rule of effectively unelected leaders. And that is the worst type of setup. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to leave as much time for the Q&A session, so I'm just going to keep my comments really brief. I think this question of, about leadership is very interesting. Um, and I think, just very quickly, the only thing I'd say around that, because I think it's kind of, you know, it's woven its way through all four of our, 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 our commentaries, is that uh, no, no good anti-authoritarian, anti-capitalist, radically socially transformative organizing that I've seen and I say good because I've seen lots of bad examples of that stuff too, but the, the, the disavows leadership. I think the question is absolutely how you, how you make that leadership uh, accountable in a radical way to, uh, to the, those who constitute an organization, whatever that organization or community is. So, um, yeah, I, I think that, that to, to posit that, and I don't think Christoph's doing this, but I think sometimes this is the, uh, the red herring, right? To posit anarchism as kind of this desire to disavow structure or disavow any kind of leadership um, is, is wrong. Um, I think the question is how does one, how does one uh, identify a leader? How does one you know, accept the mantle of a leader? How does, and you know, I think good examples of resistance movements uh, show you that they're necessary. Some people are talented in those directions, right? So uh, it's not just a question of efficacy, it's a question of, of, of resilience, of movement building too. Um, but there is, it isn't necessarily one step from acknowledging the fact that, that radical struggles for social justice need some sort of leadership, and so then we must have a party, and so then we must have a state. Um, those things don't follow necessarily. So the question is, what do we do with that? What do we do with that, with that, that need that, you know, to, to organize ourselves? Um, yeah, so I'll also try to keep things briefish. I mean, I think one thing I want to touch on a story, but it's just like, one of the things we should keep in, that I think we need to keep in mind in the conversation is that, like, in some ways, there's also something facetious about sort of the description of the panel, which is that there, it's like the idea that there are two ideologies, right, is in some ways misleading the sense that it's like, there are many ideologies within anarchism, and many ideologies within Marxism, um, and I think that that's one thing that is a difficulty in this conversation, is that I think all of us are acting in good faith and not trying to, like, hit straw men, which makes it hard for us to figure out in some ways, exactly in, after 12 minutes what the other person is saying, right? Um, but I think that one, that what comes with this is that Marxism isn't and can't be inflexible, right? And that it's like, I think that one of the problems I think that Alex is right to point out is that one of the things we've been grappling with that the left broadly construed has been grappling with at least since the 1950s is trying to rethink at various moments of what the revolutionary subject is or subjects are, right? And I think that, I mean, you know, it, Admittedly, we haven't done a great job of figuring that out collectively, but I think that there is the idea that you know, it is Marxism is not, at least in my mind, simply a lineage that goes from you know Marx to Lenin to Trotsky to now uh, un untouched, right? It's like that there is it is something that is itself historically situated and that needs to continue to be adaptable. And I think in some ways that 
one of the major questions is the question of like, what do we mean by revolution? Because I think that increasingly in the modern world, that revolution does not look like the revolution in Russia. And I think that that was actually is the major problem of Western Marxism is that the one example of revolution we do have that we struggle with is one that happened outside of the conditions under which most of us live, which is we don't have a peasantry, we don't have the collapse of war, but at the same time, there are lessons to be learned there, and I think that uh, Marxism has worked on, we, people who work within a Marxist framework have worked on trying to rethink what we mean by revolution and by revolutionary subject. Um, I think that the other thing, uh, I'll skip one of these and we can come back to it, but I think that the, I do want to touch on this question of leadership, which is, just to reemphasize one of the things that I said I think is important, is that when we talk about the question of leadership, it's not just leadership internal to our organizations or internal to our collectives or our groups. It's whether or not we're comfortable with the groups that we form collectively providing leadership outside of them, right? And that is something that I think that even groups that are comfortable um, appointing some sort of coordinating committee or some sort of uh, you know, logistics committee or some, some sort of leadership, that there's, we're still really uncomfortable with the idea that there comes a moment where we're going to encounter people outside of our groups that we may have to find ourselves in a position of leadership. And, and I don't mean a position of telling them what to do, but a position of perhaps trying to draw people towards a more radical position, trying to draw people towards more radical action, trying to organize people at a moment of defense. I mean, I think that one of my most vivid memory of Occupy, which was something that for various political reasons I sort of dropped in and out of within Halifax, um, and the real reason was that, uh, I can get into the real reason some other time. But uh, when I was there with other people who were on the periphery of it attempting to defend the encampment, um, the question of defense becomes really difficult without a question of leadership. And the reality was is that what actually would have made defense of the camp better is if the people who were in that encampment told people like me to follow their leadership and do what they said instead of holding firm to this idea that like they were uncomfortable providing leadership to a mass of people who showed up, who many of whom were willing to probably get themselves arrested if someone said that that was the plan going forward. So I think the question is, is like, what do you do when you have a tight-knit group of people who live together for months on end and then encounter a mass social movement who are generally politically aligned with them, but then they're unprepared to provide leadership to those people who are willing to follow it? Um, and I think that, so that question is, like, when we talk about leadership, we're talking about two different but interrelated sets of problems. I want to get back to the uh, idea about consensus building and what is consensus building, what it means, what skills are needed. Um, but I also want to talk about these terms power, autonomy, authority, leadership. Um, and since we've been talking about that most recently, let me, let me start with that. Um, and hopefully somebody can ask me about consensus building the, the question and answer period. Um, so Hannah Arendt defines power as uh, she says, power corresponds to the human ability not just to act, but to act in concert. Power is never the property of an individual. It belongs to a group and remains in existence only so long as the group keeps together. When we say of somebody that he is in power, we actually refer to as being empowered by a certain number of people to act in their name. Um, so there's, there's this idea of power um, in terms of sort of individual strength and character. Arendt uses the term strength for that. Um, when we talk about leadership, there's, there's many different sort of ideas that, that can come in there. Um, there's people that, that we look to, that, that we as individuals trust, um, sort of social leaders, uh, people who influence others' opinions, and that's tied in with strength of character sometimes in, in some ways. Um, that's distinct from a person who has a particular job or responsibility who we've put in a leadership position for that task because they have a particular skill or something like that. Um, that's also distinct for somebody who is in a position of authority. That is somebody who we take orders from, who we've ceded our own personal autonomy to, and when they tell us, go get arrested, we follow them. Not because we have listened to them and we respect their point of view as a leader, but because we have set them up as an authority and we haven't sort of necessarily thought through uh, the, our actions ourselves, we're, we're just following their, their, you know, their requirement. Um, I think it's really important to make distinctions between these different concepts uh, because uh, conflating them um, does get us confused, I think. Um, and 
one of the things about anarchism, as I understand it, is that it, it really does try to break down these uh, different concepts. We, anarchism is anti-authoritarian, it's anti-hierarchical. That's not the same thing as being opposed to leadership in the sense of accountability, right? If you say somebody um, has, has taken on a task, they have responsibility for doing a, a specific job, um, in fact, it goes against respect for others' autonomy if that person then fails to do their job and is not responsible for it. That's very different from authority, uh, where we haven't agreed to sort of as a group that, okay, yes, you, you've agreed to take on this responsibility for this particular task, but I'm following your orders. Um, so these, these are really different um, concepts they tend to be conflated in sort of the, the Western political tradition, I think. Um, when I envision a new, better, different world, um, it's one where we have to break apart those concepts um, well, and take uh, one with the other. I think we'll move into a question period now. Uh, we'll take them in twos and then let the panelists address them. Um, is there a quick question? In your mind, is it preferable for the organization to already have a leadership that is prepared to impose its vision when coming into contact with the world, or allow the outer world to influence its uh, ideologies before it attempts to change anything within society? Well, I mean both. I think that the most terrifying thing politically is an organization which is willing to exert its power or try to win people over to its side who are outside the organization but is completely insulated from the outside organization, right? Like, I think that you don't want a situation where you have an organization that is not responsive to the outside world. Um, I think that that's actually something that, can, can, that does happen and I think that like, that is actually one of the lessons of particularly the Maoist formations in the 1970s that we need to learn to never do, right? Is never find yourself, be so, think that you're so correct that you refuse to let changes in the outside world or what other people say to you stop you from trying to force your ideas on others. Um, I think that this is an example where the question of democratic centralism is important, is that it's difficult to think of the way in which an organization can function organizationally uh, with sort of an outside social movement if all the members of the organization aren't willing to uh, have some general plan of how to do it. Right? So if you have an organization that, where half the members uh, think that we should be ag that you should be agitating for strike action within a workplace, um, and that the other half think that you should be uh, like agitating for, uh, or that you should let the strike happen, and that you should then try to win a slate of elections in the, the in that union next time, if you've got two sides running up against each other within the same organization, then you're not functioning as any sort of political organization. So I think that having some sort of it doesn't necessarily have to be democratic centralist to kind of it's some sort of plan within the organization, some sort of willingness to take, even if you've lost a vote outside of the organization, into your outside organizing. I think that that's centrally important. Um, so I think that, if I understand your question right, I think that it's, it's one where I think an organization, ha my answer is it's an organization has to both be responsive to what happens outside of it, but when you are taking ideas and tactics and strategies outside of the organization, that it has to be sort of clearly understand what it is that it's attempting do and why it's attempting to do it. Um, but, but those decisions within the organization need to be made democratically. Yes? Um, I, just, I, I thought that the lesson you just saw you tie about consensus was, was really interesting um, in that it was very different. What I, what I saw in that, and I hope you feed this, is the, um, the problem the problem with centralization, with the idea that a central body had to come to consensus on all these questions that were often ridiculous minutia. Um, and I think this sort of, this fetishization of uh, the centralization of decision making is actually the same one that we see um, 
manifesting very differently in um, sort of closed organizations that don't operate on consensus, um, looking to the, the recent collapse of the Socialist Workers' Party in Britain, where um, fetishization of a particular decision-making process um, basically allowed some asshole to sexually assault a bunch of women and totally avoid accountability for it. Um, and I, I guess I wonder if there is, if this says less about consensus or about democratic centrism in either case than it does about um, fetishization of certain processes and the sort of um, the sort of need for forced unity where perhaps no unity exists. As in the case where, like, you know, if half of your organization votes against supporting a strike, then you need to get that fuck out of that organization. Um, and I just want to speak to that. You know, what do we do with unity in situations where that unity isn't actually there? Okay, so that would be the first uh, question. Um, Gabriel? So um, I've really appreciated this distinction between leadership and authority. I thought that was very, very well articulated. Um, and I thought, particularly, Alex, what you were saying about the, with criticisms of traditional centralized communist movements about not being able to, um, about still maintaining certain oppressive uh, forms within, within the form, even though they were trying to articulate a, uh, a resistance to them and how they were still embodied. And the, the problem, it seems to me, is that how do we stop authority from uh, moving beyond the realm in which it has authority in? And how do we allow leadership for oppressed groups and um, uh, classes that don't have power to be able to take leadership without then giving them authority in, area, in areas in which they don't necessarily need to have leadership? So how do we distribute power in a way in which leadership and authority do not become conflated? Okay, we'll start with those two. Does anyone want to take a I'd love to weigh in on that. Um, yeah, I think both of these questions actually are related, and it, they're, they're, they're very interesting. I think um, on, on the point of, of the, the perpetuation of oppressions within, within the systems of power within supposedly revolutionary organizations, I think... Um, you know, the autonomous, autonomous Marxist John Holloway has some great writing on this, and he talks about, um, um, you know, love has come up as this sort of political ethic, right? Holloway loves to talk about dignity, and he talks about the failure of so many, you know, high modernist revolutionary movements. He particularly blames uh, a sort of, you know, orthodox reading of Marxism embodied in some communist parties um, that, that, that treats people as, as a means to an end, right? And so fundamentally, uh, does violence to their to their dignity, to their autonomy, to their, and and I think that you know Maria Mize, another great Marxist feminist, has done a lot of writing on the issue of the the, the, the so-called women's issue within uh, many communist parties too, and many Marxist struggles, and how it was always a question that was going to be difficult. Well, once we've achieved, once we've seized power, once we've seized the state, once we are the ones in control, we will fix all these other issues, and you know you go down the list that applies to racism or settler indigenous issues or you know. After a while, it's like, okay, so the only issue that really matters is this, is this supposed axis of class and, uh, and, and, and that, you know, to be narrowly economistic around it. And so, um, you know, I think the, the knee-jerk reaction to it in some ways has been uh, to adopt this notion that we have to open up spaces for uh, marginalized groups, for oppressed groups to, to take leadership. And I think that that's... That's a very problematic way to think about it, obviously. First of all, it sort of recapitulates this liberal notion of tolerance, where, you know, it's my ability, my, my tolerance implies that I have the right to not to tolerate you, right? So I have, I still, it's still an exercise of power. I open up a space for you to, for you to walk into it. So we have, you know, I was involved in, in QB for a long time, um, at the local level, at the, at the regional level. And, you know, you, you is this question of representation. Do we have quotas? Do we have a formal position on the executive for these for these disadvantaged groups? And um, it wasn't they were that they were entirely bad questions to ask. It was that the, the the approach to it was always a technocratic one. It was always one of you know making space, finding the and then of course finding the right person to fill it who agreed with the, the rest of the party line. And of course what that ended up doing was to create these humongous organizations that are tremendously resource rich that ought to be putting their weight behind all kinds of 
you know, really amazing grassroots radical uh, struggles and didn't, and instead actually worked to, to put a cap on them. And then within their structures, even worse, as the example of the, of the Workers' Party in, in the UK uh, demonstrates amply, is to actually internalize and reproduce all of these forms of systematic injustice and, to, and, to, and, and, and really just to prove to be breeding grounds around this. So, I mean, I think that the, the question of leadership is a complicated one. I think it begins, honestly, with having very, with making, uh, in the work that we've been doing in the Radical Imagination Project here in Halifax recently, we've been doing a lot of thinking and working around this issue of making, not just making space, but actually making time for the effective uh, practice of, of, a, of a really deep anti-oppressive practice within movement spaces. And that has no easy answers to it. You know, you don't, we don't want to go down the road of, of sort of making movements uh, or imagining movements as nothing more than therapy groups, right? For Because we're all damaged people and particularly activists and organizers can be very damaged people, right? You, we've, we've defected from a status quo that, that, that we find deplorable for all kinds of good reasons, but has maybe damaged us in all kinds of profound ways. Uh, some of us less so than others, given our relative privilege. And so what do we do with those spaces? But I think we, we have to begin, I, I mean, I don't have the answer to that. I wish I did, right? But uh, we have to begin there. We have to begin with that acknowledgement. I think um, there is, I still hear in this, uh, and with all due respect to the, some of the comments that have been made, I still hear in this, but we're not effective. We are not efficacious. We, do, we are not seizing power. We are not throwing the, and I agree, I agree. I think that's a tremendous challenge. Um, but at the same time, that's not enough for me to say that, okay, let's, let, let us adopt much more rigid, disciplined, uh, authoritarian forms of organizing that allow for people to speak in a voice that seems uh, unified when in fact that unity has been has been coerced it has been extorted it has been uh, it has come at the cost of dispossessing people of their dignity and their power to act and has just created another more violent order on top of the existing one I, I totally agree. Um, and I'll talk to quick. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I think that, that the, the idea of envisioning power without authority is really central. Um, I want to, this, this gives me the opportunity to talk about consensus building um, because it, it is related to both questions. Um, ironically, one of the better books that I've read on a consensus building sort of decision making process uh, is from uh, some people in the management uh, department at Harvard University. <laughs> but uh, consensus, but what is consensus building? What does it look like? Um, it's a model of decision making where we get everybody um, who is going to be affected by the decision to be made together to talk about it. Um, where you, you start off with talking about what people's concerns and needs are around the process. Um, the, particular book, you know, their, their motto is you, you, you go slow to go fast, right? So there's a lot, it, it can feel frustrating to people who are not used to it at the beginning because it starts off very, very slowly, especially in a world where we are really not used to that model of decision making, where we haven't been talking about what are my needs, you know, what are your needs, uh, what, what are our fears around this decision that we need to make, that we need to hash out together. Um, that uh, requires vulnerability, it requires courage, um, and it's a lot of work that we're not used to doing, we're not trained to doing. As people who grew up in a very authoritarian, hierarchical, capitalist society, we don't have the communication and interpersonal skills to do that necessarily. So consensus building is a different model of communication. It requires different skills. As people who are often um, damaged, as you say, by uh, by the various oppressions that we face, um, that can require a lot of hard work to get to this point where we could, where we can um, effectively um, engage in consensus building, uh, decision making, um, and. Uh, Yes, so, um, so it, can, it can look frustrating uh, when you're just starting that process because it's a really long process. Right? So it looked like a lot, of, a lot of occupies outside of the sort of, sort of central one at Occupy Wall Street and probably the main 
sort of strongest, more, most radical one in Oakland, um, did have a lot of issues around the decision-making processes and structures because people came to it with different skills, with different expectations, um, and maybe they didn't always have those, those really necessary foundational conversations. Um, the other important part to a consensus building decision-making process is that you want to come to some sort of agreements about what's going to happen, right? what decision is being made. Um, but the, the goal is that they be self-enforcing agreements. Um, and so this ties back into this idea of leadership and how do we, how do we have accountability for our leaders, depending on how we define leaders, the people who we have given responsibility for, for performing certain tasks on behalf of a group. Um, if you have done all of the proper preparatory work, all of the slow, hard preparatory work, and you've come to a consensus agreement, um, ideally, you've built into that agreement, okay, how are we going to check in that I've done my piece of the, of the agreement, that you've done your piece of the agreement? Um, how are we going to uh, make sure that that happens? And that is actually part of the agreement. Right. It's not just, oh, we make this decision, everybody follows it. The follow-up um, and how we deal with if somebody is unable to keep up their, their task that they've agreed to is part of the decision. Um, in the uh, IWW uh, organizing model, for example, uh, one, of the, one of the things is you know, giving people, uh, you know, requesting that they perform small tasks um, and then sort of working up to, to other tasks to sort of get them to, to feel involved with your workplace organizing effort. Um, sometimes people aren't able to complete those tasks. So then what do you do? Well, you don't throw your hands up and say, oh, I guess we can't organize our workplace. You go to them and you say, what, what, um, so what went on here? Like what, what, what made you uncomfortable or made you unable to perform that task? And you work with people and try and say, okay, you know, we had this agreement, we, we both have done the foundational work, we know that this end goal is the thing that we, that we both, or that we all want to work towards. What is it exactly that's getting in the way of you accomplishing that, that piece of the, the puzzle that you agreed to take on responsibility for? Um, and especially because we're all steeped in capitalist hierarchical tradition, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons that that could be, and a lot of very good reasons. Um, and so the, the key there and part of the consensus decision-making process is to go back and support each other through those obstacles so that we can support each other to do the, the tasks that we've agreed to do and to, to hold ourselves and each other accountable and responsible, but in a compassionate and supportive way. Because it is very hard to disagree with what you just said because it sounds wonderful. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not disagreeing with those wonderful aspects you just described. I guess what I'm disagreeing with, and that's my remark from earlier, is whether this actually is workable and feasible. And I think Occupy had shown some of the limits of some of these ideas. So, and to answer the question from the comment from the AK Press, um, you know. The political unity question is, of course, an important one. People tend to affiliate with those people who share their political ideas. That's why some of us are in different organizations, and I'm sure there are other organizations represented. So that's how kind of people group together, naturally. Um, and I think nobody wants to recreate an organization or an organization that recreates oppressive structures when in reality, that organization should be dedicated to working for the liberation of humanity. You know, I'm not, I'm not advocating to have a model like the SWP and repeat that. I think that's not a good model to follow. But what I am advocating is to have an organization that combines elements of freedom of discussion of the members in order to reach the best possible decision where ideas are debated, threshed out and proposals made and counter proposals made and argued, argued, argued and then through a democratic process of electing and voting on those proposals a decision is made. Why? Because you can't talk forever and it seems possible when it is a non-urgent issue and everybody has time and you know it's cool 
but when something fundamentally shifts in society, when there is a struggle going on, when the enemy is literally locking, knocking on your door, the parameters somehow change. And people usually realize that very quickly. And they realize we need to come to a decision because we need to do something. And that's simply reality of struggle of different forces with each other, of capitalists with workers. In those situations, you need to come to a decision because you need to act. And I believe you need to act in unity. I voluntarily submit you know, to decisions made by people I elect in an organization that I trust. And I will go along and carry out those decisions. Because I think it will be better that we all act together after we discussed and agreed, rather than discussing and agreeing and then those who disagree go off and do their own thing. What's the point of discussing in the first place if we then all go off in different directions? It actually weakens us. I think the ability to say, I will go along with the majority decision and support that, even though I have some doubts about it, will make the overall goal more likely to be realized. I submit voluntarily to that democratic decision. Unless the decision was so fundamentally wrong and so clearly opposed to everything I believe in that I would have to leave the organization altogether and affiliate with people who are more likely to make decisions that are in line with my political beliefs. I think that's the kind of unity. Um, do I have time? Or? Uh, well, I think compared to the other speakers, you would have another minute. Or another minute. <laughs> so, so that's kind of the decision making, I guess, internally that I'm thinking of. But then, of course, the reality we have now is that we are in different groups with some different programs or beliefs or functioning. So, how can we work together? I believe it's possible on clearly agreed and defined terms. I call that united front work, you can call it coalition work. Um, and I think those opportunities arise. I talked to Andoni last night and one of the examples I always give, because I experienced it, um, is anti-fascist work. I think we all agree that fascists need to be dealt with and I hope you all agree that we need to stop them from organizing and marching down the street. So on that basis, I would propose that all of us have that agreement that on day X we all turn up an hour before they're supposed to assemble in the main square and prevent them from assembling and marching. And on that basis, we would strike an agreement that is very specific. The objective is to stop the fascists from marching on that day. To that extent, we will work together, collaborate, and act as one, hopefully, in order to be strong. So smash their fucking heads in. <laughs> <laughs> and I would be happy if we can achieve that unity and carry out that successful action and that's what I believe are moments where we can come together we don't necessarily agree on what the Soviet Union represented but we can, <laughs> but we can agree on the need to stop the fascists and that's the kind of unity that I advocate actively whenever I have the opportunity okay. oh, yeah I mean I was going to I'll yeah. try to I mean, a couple quick things on this. Uh, one thing is, uh, for anybody who's not up on the minutia of left gossip, so the SWP, the uh, <laughs> funny fact, SWP, the split in the SWP formed the ISN, the International Socialist Network, which just split again on Thursday. Um, so things are, things are moving. As I said, Marxism always changing. Um, I think that actually like, one of the things um, that Brad was right about is that, like, the problem with consensus decision making in uh, the in most situations with Occupy was not just that like big decisions drag on forever; it's that small decisions drag on forever, and that uh, I mean, my argument from that would be: I understand what you're what you're saying, Brad, is that decisions that should never have actually been put to a central body were being put to a central body, um, and I think there were probably were definitely instances with that. There's also instances where. Uh, that's one situation where having you know, executive committees can be used as one solution to that problem. Um, but I also understand where you're coming from, and I think that it's like, that's a case-by-case -case basis, and I think there are examples uh, where both it, things should have been delegated out to a decision-making body, and in other cases where they should have been pulled away from 
decision making at all in a central body. Um, one thing that I think is important about Occupy when we talk about those, I actually think that it's in some ways wrong for us to use Occupy as like this as an example of an anarchist organization, because in a lot of ways, it's actually the thing that I was trying to talk about at the beginning, which is that people, who, like there was a bunch of people who got together in many cases, uh, who couldn't imagine actually organizing in any way other than like these general anarchist anarchistic principles, right? That it's like there was no conversation at Occupy Halifax if this model of consensus-based decision making was the right one. It was just like people were drinking coffee at just us and we're gonna make decisions based on consensus-based decision making and everyone else is occupying in two weeks and so are we. And that's essentially part of the problem is that we, we've internalized the idea in a lot of ways that like a version of anarchism is the only way forward uh, without the sort of robust reasoning that I think that you two have for it. Like I think you two have both, both robust reasoning for why you think the models that you believe we should organize under should, we should organize under. But I think that too often it has become the default in the way that uh, that really the, the default for many people in the 1950s was a really brutal authoritarian form of a style of like a Stalinized way of organizing, right? So I think that in some ways, like Occupy represents something a problem, but perhaps not one with anarchism itself, rather with the thoughtless like adoption. Um, I think that, I just want to, can I address the second one real quickly, which is just like, I think that just the self-enforcing the agreement that Eva talked about is like, that's also how like uh, democratic uh, centralism works too. Right? The agreement is not enforced by anyone other than yourself. Like when I talk about a discipline, I'm talking about a self-discipline, right? I'm not talking about the idea that like, people should be flogged if they <laughs> don't follow the main agreement. It's like this, the self-enforcing agreement and the supports and asking why we failed here and taking collective responsibility for why an organizing effort failed is one that I don't think is, can only happen uh, in sort of a consensus-based model. Um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. It seems that a common element in all the talks is that we don't actually have two very extreme poles of Marxism at least in some of the elements somewhere in the middle, be it Marxist critique or anarchist practice or what have you. Um, and in the last couple of decades, especially, we've seen a shift towards more anarchistic horizontality. Um, I was reading an article the other day about vocabulary of the new left versus like the post new left of today, in which the language has really shifted from like liberation over growing the state to creating safer spaces or instead of the people to intersectionality. Um, and given Occupy and all that happened, I think few will argue that actually these horizontal pushes of creating, uh, rethinking our personal relations, creating alternative communities is necessarily a bad thing. But I want to ask if, when, and how we do engage with the state. How do we challenge power or authority? And I think um, something, examples like the Zapatistas also kind of raise, raise that question as well. I think right now, I think the government of Mexico is okay to not have to worry or really provide services to the poor state there. But when do we get to the point where they're so big in size or number that you have to engage? And how, how does that happen in different forms? Uh, I, I, just a very simple question as you, as, uh, as you go through. Um, all of you have some kind of orientation to Marxism or have some kind of affinity to it. Uh, what is Marxism for you? Because it seems one way it's coming out tactically. Like Marxism is an organizational but what is Marxism in relationship to the broader left? Like, what? How do you understand it? Anybody wants to tackle one of those two questions? Um, uh, they're both great questions. Um, I think maybe just your question first, and me. I'd say that uh, I I would identify certainly with the theoretical trend of Marxism that would be identified as autonomous Marxism. I think autonomous Marxism is is really a very rich analytical strand that emerges also out of people's concrete struggles and, and frustrations with some uh, maybe more doctrinaire forms of Marxism, so older forms, more doctrinaire forms of organizing uh, the centrality of the party, all those kinds of things. Also the relationship between capital and struggle and how that, that works. Uh, for, for me, um, Marxism is, uh, like I said before, I think the most robust and, and relentless way of, of, of rigorously understanding the science of exploitation that is capitalism. And um, 
and, and for me, Marxism is, is that. It is not primarily an organizing strategy. I see the, you know, um, the tendencies that have emerged out of it obviously uh, are strongly affiliated with it, but, but Marxism as such, for me, it doesn't mean organizing. Anarchism, perhaps, is closer to, to actual organizing, but lacks the ideological robustness, I think, of Marxism, and certainly lacks, like, Mar anarchist analysis, <coughs> especially of capitalism, comes from Marxism, unless it's some horrible form of anarcho-capitalism, which most anarchists would reject as, as a form of anarchism at all, right? Um, so I'd say, for me, that's, that's where I come at it. Um, on the question of engagement, I think it's a great one. I think you're absolutely right. Um, this is the, you know, in some ways, it's the crux of it all. I don't know. Uh, depending upon the day that you catch me, it's like, well, this question will be irrelevant because we're all hurtling towards destruction. The people that will survive will reconstitute themselves outside of states that are no longer able to function as such. And I think that, you know, to some extent, this is what I meant when we were talking about revolution, you know. We, we presume that the status quo is almost indefinite in terms of where where our ideological uh, touchstones come from. They come from, as the poster well identifies, the Industrial Revolution and, and this, this modern sort of modernity born out of the Enlightenment. Uh, they may reject liberalism, but they're in the same bed with liberalism. In that sense, they emerge out of this crucible. And um, to the same extent that people seem to uh, presume that uh, we will face challenges, but nothing dramatic is going to happen, you know, in terms of the, uh, the, the balance of forces internationally or the ability of states to continue to do what they do on the basis of, um, you know, uh, uh, like an industrial petroleum-based revolution or a, a process. Like, I think that there are real questions there as to whether that's true or not. I think that um, our notions of revolution are very much wrapped up in that, and I think that it's just a fundamental problem. I think what the Zapatistas have done, though they wouldn't say it this way, and I hesitate to frame it this way, but since it's a panel about Marxism and anarchism, I'd say that the Zapatistas have developed, what they've done is effectively displace the state in areas where they exercise control. They have developed, they've not descended into this fuzzy, sort of vaguely middle class notion of, you know, uh, you know let's, let's all get together and make sure we all feel really good and live in a house that's, you know, quirky and alternative and we won't have any of the normal rules of society. What they've done is take seriously the question of social transformation and say, okay, well, you know, these forms have not just not worked for us, but they've done tremendous violence to us. How can we do something else? And they've elaborated institutions. They have leaders who are subject to recall. They, they take positions. And when it's a matter of urgency, they take votes. Like when they decided to go to war, that was a vote. And the communities, the, the people who didn't vote for it had to leave the communities. You know, I'm not advocating necessarily for that form of organization, but I think there are, there are ways of merging a commitment to radically democratic pra practice with the need to be uh, robust in your engagements when, when there is, when there's something immediate on the line, right? Um, but I think in the case of the state, I think what's interesting is that the Mexican government would say today, well, we've just, we've tr this isn't a problem for us anymore. This is, we've stepped back, we have taken, and in reality, the Zapatistas have proven entirely resilient in the face of the state's varied attempts to demobilize and destroy them. Mm -hmm. uh, either, either through the legislative process, through the military process, through a process of um, you know, neglect. All those things have failed. And what the Zapatistas have done is to elaborate institutions along an anarchist ethic of, of, of parallel power, where they've displaced the state. And they've, and literally, you know, government supporters are now coming to Zapatistas and saying, we have a land dispute, something's going on in my, we, can we use your systems of justice to adjudicate it? Now that, to me, is revolutionary. The control of territory is revolutionary. The ability to, to displace, uh, dehumanizing, um, exploitative, and oppressive systems is revolutionary. And does that mean the Zapatistas have solved all those problems within their own structures? Of course, not at all, right? And there are all kinds of social problems within communities that persist because people aren't perfect. Does that mean that they have all the solutions for the rest of us? Of course not, and I'm not sure, you know, when we think about parallels elsewhere, this is the limits to learning from other, other revolutionary processes is that they belong to their own time and place. It doesn't mean they, that we don't need to learn from them, of course. But I think it's an excellent question, and you're right. I mean, I think that uh, along the lines of what everybody here today has said, I think there is a question of pragmatism that you know you need to be able to say, ideally, this is my world, and yet in practice, how will I how will I deal with these with these forces with this with these uh, systems of power when we're compelled to when they bump up against us. And I think that kind of intentionality has to be a part of it. If we're serious, 
you know, otherwise let's just go around and throw paintballs at banks and stuff like that. But that's not serious. That's just, you know, that's just frustration. That's not serious social change. Okay, we have very little time left, so maybe consider answering those questions as your closing remarks as well. Whoever wants to follow up. Okay, thank you. Um, so the question of Marxism and state and power, um, you asked how do we engage with the state. I'm not entirely sure that's the best way of phrasing the question because I find myself being engaged by the state whether I want to or not. And I think that's the reality, that the state exists and the state will tell me and you how things are. It will tell you what the student fees are and it will tell you what offense will send you to prison and how long the sentence will be and under what conditions you will serve your sentence. All of those things are how the state engages with its dear citizens. So I engage the state as my opponent in current society because the current function of the state is to oppress and to maintain the rule of capital. And that brings me to how Marxists see it. Which means that, in my view, we cannot reform the oppressive nature of the current state. Some people advocate police reform, you know, make the cops a bit more accountable and nicer. I think that's bullshit. <laughs> but but anarchists would say the same thing. So what's specific about Marxism? Right, so specific is that Marxists believe that the existing state cannot be taken over. And that Marxist belief, we need to replace it with a new type of state, which I think I alluded to early on, with a state that is based on workers' rule, on workers' councils. It will still be a state, which will disappoint the anarchists, but I think it's the best way to defend the interests of the majority of people, to have that worker state in order to guard ourselves against the counterattack by capital and bourgeoisie. That's how I see it. I see the worker state, a newly type, new type of state, as our main defense of our gains after the revolution. And that is, I guess, the, for me, why I am a Marxist, that I believe that the revolution needs to be defended once it is successful, and the best tool that the working class will have will be a proletarian state, which is run and controlled by the workers themselves, through what I call Soviets, or you can call workers' councils, through their democratic participation in society. They will, we, should I say, not they, we will no longer be spectators, but we will be active participants in running society. Thank you. Stant has a, a vision or a model that we call practical communism, um, which is uh, very similar to the mosaic or network model that I was describing earlier. Um, and to Rather than re-describe it, let me give you an example. Um, so in my neck of the woods out in the Annapolis Valley, uh, a lot of people are becoming more and more concerned about fracking. Um, you know, it's something that is known to be harmful to groundwater. Um, so some people that I talk to, uh, that, I, that I'm friends with, uh, are, you know, what can we do about fracking? How can we keep uh, our groundwater from being affected by this in, in the town that we live in? Um, what we advocate, sort of the, the way we would deal with that practical problem that's directly in front of us, is um, to try and help people address it in a way that builds their own power and builds their own autonomy. So instead of asking the state for, you know, to do something for us, we would try to organize people to um, do something themselves. Um, so we would try to engage with the state as little as possible, basically. Um, so what, what we could do, for example, is we could say, okay, let's go around to all of the towns in our watershed and let's, let's have some town meetings of all of the people who live there um, and talk about this issue and say, you know, so one of my friends wanted to have our town, have, you know, declare our town to be a frack-free zone by some sort of town bylaw. I'm like, okay, that's probably not going to do much. Um, but what if we went around and as a start to all of the towns, we, we sort of had this sort of discussion and, and each of the towns said, okay, you know, our town, we're going to be, we're going to declare ourselves to be a no fracking area. 
Um, but if we do it in a way where we are getting everybody together to discuss that, to give them a sense that, you know what, this is, this is our water that, that we have to live with, and so it's, we have a right to make decisions about what happens to, to our environment that we're living in. Um, then, okay, so you get a bunch of towns that, you know, maybe, maybe a whole bunch of towns, like all the towns in the watershed pass some bylaws that, you know, say we're not gonna have fracking in our town. Um, so then the question is, you know, what happens in the long run? Um, eventually the province might come in and say, yeah, your town bylaws don't count for anything. Well, if you've built up that organization, that, that grassroots democratic organization, then people are gonna look at that and say, wait a second, you know, we went to all this work, we have built up this idea um, that this is our environment that we get to have a say in. We've built up our confidence in our own ability to, to assert ourselves and to stand up for our own autonomy, our own decision making around our environment that affects us. And then you have the organization in place that can push back against this, you know, the provincial state's incursion um, on, on that, that you know, assault on, on our natural environment. Um, and then you have, you have, yeah, you have the, the power as a group and the organiz organizational structure uh, to then resist that sort of state incursion. Um, so our model of practical communism or this model of sort of a mosaic or networked model of, of sort of building towards a revolution, um, the idea behind it is that we we kind of ignore the state. Um, the state is going to make incursions on our lives. And those, the state makes some incursions on our lives that, that create, um, creates violence, creates problems that we have to deal with. You know, our economic structure makes some incursions on our lives that creates violence, that creates problems that we have to deal with. Our other hierarchical structures that we have to deal with, incursions on our lives that create violence, create problems that we have to deal with. Um, our response to that is to get people together and build our power collectively um, and build our, our comfort with asserting our individual autonomy and build our networks and our compassionate communities um, in a way that doesn't rely on the state, right? In a way that builds that collective group, community power. Um, that's one way of addressing these very specific concerns that are right in front of us. Uh, it's a way that, in the long run, builds networks that are going to resist state and other incursions. Um, and then the question is, I mean, so the, the central question that Christoph brought up is, okay, you know, we have a revolution. We've overthrown the current bourgeois capitalist state. What do we do then? Well, if we haven't spent that time building up our ability to govern ourselves, then maybe we do need some other state to come in and replace the current capitalist bourgeois state. But our goal is a stateless society. Our goal is a society without hierarchy. So if we are addressing the current problems that are in front of us that you know, affect our survival, affect our mental health, affect our physical health, in a way that builds our capacity for do organizing and governing ourselves collectively and with that uh, with that respect for individual autonomy, um, then when we get there, we don't need a state afterwards. We can govern ourselves already. Chris? I can just work into the closing remarks. Um, well, those sort of things. Oh, the yes. closing remarks? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, cool. I'll work them in now. So. <laughs> uh, okay, so two things. So, like, basically, how do the two questions, like, how do we engage in the state? And the answer, in large part to me, is, like, through, I think, the most effective way is, an important way in a lot of ways, is through existing social movements, right? In particular, from my own experiences, I'm thinking both the labor movement and the student movement. Um, there's sort of a few reasons which I'll go through quickly why I think that's important. The first is, is that like, how many of us found radical politics through some form of social movement, right? Through the women's movement, through the queer rights movement, through the labor movement, through the student movement. And in my case, that was because I realized through the student movement that like social democratic politics were bullshit, right? Like I realized that butting my head against that was really fucking difficult 
and was not going to get us anywhere. I like to say that like, I'm no longer as naive as I once was. Right now, I, I don't believe in like utopian things like reforming the state through social democracy. I believe in actual solutions. Um, the other thing is, is that we want to win interim reforms, right? Reforms that ideally build towards revo like revolutionary change, but also reforms that make living conditions in the present a bit less hellish, because life under capitalism is a fucking horror. And the reality is, is that until the revolution comes, I'm not going to leave people who need special dietary, uh, who have special dietary needs without the means to actually purchase it because welfare rates are too low, right? Um, so I think that like that's another reason. And then the reason is, is that come a revolutionary situation, we want these social movements on side. But the flip side of it is, is that we don't want them on the side of capital, right? Like not like it's not just about bringing them on side on the name of like being on the revolutionary side. It's the same reason why the Indiana Pacers are trying to sign Andrew Bynum. It's not just because they want him in come playoff time, it's that they don't want the Miami Heat to have him come playoff time. <laughs> That's an analogy that was lost, right? Um, <laughs> the point is you don't always like in some ways you want to take you want to take those social movements out of the forces of reaction. And if you can't bring them all the way on side, at least stop having them throw up roadblocks the way that Alex talked about, right? Um, the other thing is this question of I think this question of like why, why like what do I mean when I say I'm a Marxist, but also what do I mean when I when I'm identifying as that as opposed to an anarchist? Um, part of that is one of the things that I think is important is that like I mean I identify also like I identify as a communist. Ultimately, I believe that we I want to believe that we can arrive at a point where we no longer need a state. It is this inter. It's how do we get there that I think is actually this question of disagreement, right? And one of the things that I think is really important, and one of the reasons why I think that when I talk about being a Marxist, is that I recognize that we can treat each other better, we can treat ourselves better. But ultimately, one of the things that constrains our social relations, and the primary thing that constrains our social relations is the economic conditions under which we live. And I think that to believe that we can overcome those economic conditions through an act of will, or even an act of organization, is ultimately misguided. I think that if we want to live in a world where we have like true, sort of just and loving social relations, and I think that like one of the things that like is actually really nice is that we have talked about this idea of community and love, um, and I think that like I, I long for that, but I think that the reality is is that to actually get there and create a situation where that's sustaining, we have to change the economic base first, and maybe that like makes me sort of old timey to think that we have to get there first, but I think that like to, I think it's wrong to believe that we can change completely change social relations and then economics will follow if we don't have sort of the sort of economic and political problems really dealt with before we move into some sort of state of a social revolution that we're not going to find ourselves able to sustain uh, in any sort of meaningful and widespread way uh, the sort of loving and just world that I, I think the four of us all sort of really agree that we're pursuing in our political work. So I, I would end that at least my thoughts for the day there. So uh, that concludes our panel. Thank you all very much for coming.